Good afternoon and welcome to the Serious Security Seminar here at Purdue University. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Mihaela Vorvaranu here from uh, the department in the College of Technology, Departments of Organizational Leadership and Supervision and Computer Graphics Technology. She, along with Professor Lorraine Kisselberg of Communication and our one of our own grad students, uh, Preeti Rao, uh, did a report on behalf of the McAfee Corporation, which has just recently been published worldwide, covering the topic of social media in the workplace and its acceptance and uh, security issues related to that. And so Mahela will talk about the research methods and their findings. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for being here. I would just like to um, start with an aside to the introduction. Although I'm in the College of Technology and work in uh, both the departments of computer graphics and organizational leadership and supervision, uh, my training is actually from the Department of Communication. And so um, in some ways, Lorraine and I are not quite as interdisciplinary as it might sound um, at first sight. So um, I'll be talking to you about this project. I think it might be interesting from a couple of points of view. Um, not only the results and the findings themselves, which are quite fascinating, but the process itself of uh, working on research in collaboration with industry. So I'm first going to give you a bit of background about the project, what it was and what our role was in the project, and then we're going to dive in and um, I'll give you an overview of the results um, of this research. So uh, what this basically is, it's a report um, that was commissioned by uh, McAfee. Um, and as you probably already know, McAfee is a global uh, provider of security solutions. Um, you probably have the little red shield somewhere on your computer. If you're using Windows, it pops out in the um, bottom right corner and asking you to update it all the time, which is actually a good thing. And uh, they wanted to do and publish a report on the global trends in organizational use of Web 2.0. They wanted to identify how organizations worldwide use Web 2.0 technologies, what Web 2.0 te tools they use and what they find useful, what their concerns, the benefits um, are. The report has actually already been released. It's uh, already, I think, a couple of weeks. It was released on September 27th. And uh, you can download it from the McAfee webpage or the link that's displayed on your screen. Um, so to get started, um, I think it's appropriate to um, provide you with the definition of Web 2.0 um, as used in this research. Um, there's a lot of controversy about what, what Web 2.0 is and is not. Um, founding articles in the field give us the characteristics of Web 2.0, but not necessarily the definitions. We didn't find that this would be the place to argue over definitions, and so we provided a simp uh, simple encompassing definition of Web 2.0. Our working definition was really consumer social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Wikipedia, and so on, as well as Enterprise 2.0 solutions. These might be uh, commercial platforms that are installed within the firewall, uh, WebEx, Citrix, SharePoint, uh, things like GoToMeeting.com. These are all solutions that are um, obviously not free, um, and they're uh, bought and installed by corporations and used for collaboration um, and other purposes. So this was what, what was included in our um, research on Web 2.0. And uh, I would actually like to start by asking you a question. Imagine you are McAfee. Why would you want to do research and commission a report on Web 2.0? Any guesses? How might that be related or how might that impact your business? You have to think of something, otherwise we'll just be sitting here for one full hour. <laughs> Any wild guesses? Availability of information. Anything else that you might be thinking? How, what, how do you think about Web 2.0 when it comes to security? Do you perceive it as a highly secure and safe medium um, or set of media? Or might Web 2.0 pose um, a special set of security threats? 
Because remember, McAfee is concerned with computer security and data security. Yeah. Uh, I would say that social engineering attacks are more common, particularly in, in websites like Facebook or Twitter, uh, where users are tempted to click on a link that takes them to a malicious site. Okay. Right. So from uh, certain points of view, social engineering, uh, things like phishing, um, can be more common in social media. Um, what else might be going on there? If you think about Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, right? Uh, many companies actually use Facebook. It's a valid platform that they use for customer relations, for marketing, for public relations. How much of Facebook can they control? Where does all the data reside? On the Facebook servers, which is outside the company servers, which is outside the company's firewall and outside the company's control. Which, if you are a company that has um, important information, and most companies do have important information, I might say, uh, that would make you quite nervous. That a lot of your data, a lot of activity that is crucial to your business is happening outside the corporate firewall, uh, where there are a lot more threats, not only phishing attacks, but we've seen lately a lot of um, mal uh, malware, viruses, all sorts of other threats that have been going on recently, uh, both on Facebook and Twitter, right? Um, so in, from that point of view, we see that Web 2.0 could pose a special set of security threats that is somewhat different than what companies experienced before. And for a security company, I would assume it's important to know what those are and to be able to develop products to be able to help people um, use Web 2.0 safely if they choose to do so. And so this is what happened as part of this research project. Um, there were two main forms of data collection. One of them, the major one, was a survey of over 1,000 IT decision makers in 17 countries. Um, the sample was balanced by country and sector, which means that we had about equal numbers of uh, participants from different countries. And there was about a 60-40 split between the uh, private and the public sector. This survey was designed and, uh, uh, by McAfee, and um, it was administered by a survey company, Vanson Bourne, from the UK. The moment where Lorraine and I and Pretty came into play was when the data was still being collected on the survey. They were ready to wrap it up. They gave us the survey data. We were supposed to um, help analyze it and help come up with some sort of thread, some sort of important information, some sort of narrative or story that we could then put into a report and make that survey data um, understandable and readable in a narrative format. To help with uh, making the survey data more interesting um, and to interpret it as well, the three of us also conducted in-depth interviews with, in uh, with industry analysts, with social media consultants, uh, with experts from both the industry and academia. And so some of the information that I'll give you, some of the background stories and opinions are going to come from those in-depth interviews. And so after much uh, thinking and debate, and after feeling for about half a day that we were drowning in data, um, we came up with a structure for how all this information could be organized. And uh, we found that it could be organized around these three main topics. And these are the three main topics that I'll present to you today. The first one is adoption of Web 2.0 in organizations worldwide. The second one is employee use of Web 2.0 and um, the associated risks and benefits. And the third one would be how people, how companies can uh, mitigate the risks associated with, with Web 2.0, balance them so they can use Web 2.0 securely. And so um, I'm just gonna get started and present to you some of the large global level findings on Web 2.0 adoption. Um, these are the overall adoption rates by country. And yes, I know this might be a little bit hard to read. And so I pulled out for you the top five countries that have reported adoption rates over 80%. So remember, these are not home users or individuals. These are organizations. And so over 80% of the organizations that were surveyed in these countries, Brazil, Spain, India, Singapore, and Mexico, were using some sort of Web 2.0 application. 
if you look at the graph, overall adoption rates are pretty high and they actually are higher than 60% for even the lowest country on the chart, which happens to be Canada. Um, from a US perspective, and at least from my perspective, I do a lot of work in uh, Web 2.0 and social media, and I feel that everybody around me in, in the US uses Web 2.0 and Facebook and Twitter, and they're so important, and that we have very high adoption rates. So it is very enlightening to look at this kind of research and actually we have similar data that confirms that this is the case, that the US, in spite of uh, many beliefs, is not one of the leading adopters of uh, these technologies. However, they might be setting trends about how these technologies um, should be used. Okay, um, so as you can see, 60% uh, would be the lowest reported adoption rate. The main uses for Web 2.0 in organizations were as follows. Um, for IT, that was the main use that was reported, uh, followed by sales or marketing, and then customer relations. Advertising and public relations were also very important uses of Web 2.0. Now, um, my background is actually in, is in public relations, and so I'm very, I would have been very tempted to write the survey questions a bit differently. And, um, I am quite sure that had I written the survey questions and lumped together advertising, marketing, and public relations, that might have emerged as the primary use of Web 2.0 worldwide. Um, however, I didn't get to write the questions, and um, um, IT emerged, you know, I feel a bit competitive here as the main use of Web 2.0. All right. So we have some very interesting um, uh, balance or contradictions between the perceived benefits of Web 2.0 applications and their uh, reported importance, okay? Uh, we see that a lot of the companies, 73%, about three-fourths, right, um, believe that Web 2.0 can open new revenue streams, okay? And that was true of both companies in the private sector and the public sector, so things like government agencies, right? and nonprofits. Now, granted, they are not, uh, their purpose is not to make money, but um, it might mean that Web 2.0 could save them money, and if they are financed by taxes, then that is a good thing for everyone. Um, for various Web 2.0 tools, and you'll see the detail later, they all were considered as being able to help with communication and collaboration, and the agreement varies there by tool, but it's around 60%. Um, in terms of customer service, that was also an important benefit that they perceived, about 40, 45%, and then 40% for marketing, right? So what we see here are um, quite considerable benefits, you would say, from a, an organizational perspective. On the other hand, and I was a bit puzzled by this, and I think Lorraine felt the same way, um, only 42% perceive that Web 2.0 tools are actually important to business operations. Okay, so even though on the one hand we see that they could reap all these benefits, on the other hand we see that they're not considered as really fundamental and important to business operations. And we can only speculate and wonder why that is. It could be because maybe not everybody is using them yet, or maybe because the tools are still new and you still have to prove their value in order for everybody to believe in them and consider them important. It could also be that even though these benefits are real, the practice of using Web 2.0 tools is not, that, um, is not commonplace and is not, has not become uh, second nature and fundamental to the organization's operation. It's something that they're using on the side, something that they might not know. Many people are wondering, is Twitter going to survive? Is there going to be a Twitter in 10 years? Is it even worth investing in Twitter, for example, right? And so even though they might be seeing some benefits, um, they might not perceive it as fundamentally important to business operations. We also asked uh, about the major concerns regarding uh, Web 2.0 use. And uh, as you can see here, security is the major concern that emerged from this survey research. Uh, about half of respondents are concerned with security. Uh, another major concern was productivity, which um, is almost a third. They were concerned that actually using Web 2.0 will decrease instead of increasing productivity. 
legal risks about 15% and reputational damage at 9%. Now, as you interpret this data, there are two things to remember. Um, well, one of the things is that the people that were surveyed, all of them were CEOs or CIOs. They worked in IT. Okay? So as far as they're concerned and as far as their job descriptions go, they are supposed to be about, concerned about security. Right? That is their job description. This does not make the data uh, inaccurate, uh, but it helps us understand why the security concerns are so high. And also, if you happen to be McAfee, that is pretty good news for you, right? Because this shows that there's a lot of need and a good market for uh, your products. All right. So we're not now going to move to the second main section of the findings, and this is about employee use of Web 2.0. And this is going to be um, the longer and more detailed section. There's a lot of interesting detail going on in how employees um, use social media. Okay. So first of all, um, they were asked about um, a number of different tools that were in use and then uh, about the perceived utility of these tools. And globally, webmail emerged as the most useful tool. It is perceived, it is perceived as the most useful tool. Uh, followed by these collaborative platforms um, that I talked about earlier. By, uh, followed then by at 40% by content sharing sites. And these were um, actually bulked into quite a lot a lot of types of social media was in there, ranging from blogs to Wikipedia. Streaming media, sites like YouTube, and social network sites, such as Facebook or High Five or Orkut, were perceived as some of the least useful. And so I need you to remember something here. I need you to remember that social network sites, at this point, are perceived as the least useful of all the tools, right? They're at the bottom. Mental note. In this graph, which is a little bit hairy, I admit, but if you take the patience to look at it, uh, you're going to follow the same kind of information. Uh, the different colors represent different Web 2.0 tools. And the data is by country, so it shows in which country a certain tool is perceived as more or less useful. And overall, these lines follow the patterns that I showed you before in the previous slide. However, and those were averages across all the countries. However, when you look at this particular slide, you uh, begin to see some exceptions. And we don't know exactly what's going on there, but there are some interesting exceptions. There's, uh, for example, this one. There's a very interesting spike, both up and down. That's very different from all the other lines, which pre are more or less parallel. So let's see what's going on there. Uh, that is data from the United Kingdom, where the pattern seems to be a little bit reversed, and webmail is considered relatively less useful. And collaborative platforms, those enterprise 2.0 platforms, are considered more useful. Okay? Now, uh, we don't know exactly why that is, all right? uh, but it could be that as people get to use these collaborative platforms more, they get to understand them, and they go beyond that stage where they're still thinking about the platform and how it works, rather than actually doing the work because they're not used to the tool, they might perceive it as more useful. So I wanted to look a bit at collaborative platforms in more detail. And so the blue line that you're seeing is the graph with the perceived utility of collaborative platforms across the countries, and the other ones are grayed out. Okay. Uh, so we see quite a lot of variation in the perceived utility of collaborative platforms. It goes up and down, up and down. This to me is very interesting because of all the other tools that the survey asked about, these are actually the ones that are supposed to be the most important for business. They're supposed to be helping productivity, right? There is no worry about WebEx or GoToMeeting.com that somebody is going to be goofing off there looking at pictures of you know, an a trip or a party the previous weekend, right? So while people have such concerns about Facebook, they pay a lot of money to uh, buy these collaborative platforms. And obviously, these are answers from people, from organizations who reported using the collaborative platforms in the first place, right? 
And so they pay the money, they have them in their organizations, they use them, and yet the perceived utility varies a lot from country to country, okay? Um, so this is very interesting. It means that, what could it mean? Either they're not that useful, or we don't uh, know how to use them well to make the best out of them, um, because they might involve a different way of working. They might not still be perceived as so useful because people are still getting used to, to them. Um, there are a number of ideas and of guesses um, about what could explain this uh, variation. And I don't know if you happen to have any ideas. Anybody? Were you thinking of something as I was? Maybe not. All right. Okay. Um, so now when we delve a little bit bigger, uh, deeper into the value of certain web tool applications, okay, we see that some, uh, um, some of the most value that people, that organizations get is in terms of improved communication, which makes sense. All of these platforms can be used for communication. Customer service, increased productivity, marketing, and branding, which is also a part of marketing, right? And so here in this table, um, I'm looking and seeing some interesting things. I'm seeing that in terms of improved communication, and this is very interesting, about 65% of organizations picked these collaborative platforms. Remember those that some people thought were useful, some people didn't think were useful. And then social networking sites, which were at the bottom of the utility rankings, okay, as useful for improving communication. So all of a sudden, we see here that social network sites do have some value for the organization, some perceived value. Okay. In terms of increased productivity, and this makes me sigh with relief, right? This is not very surprising. It makes sense, right, that collaborative platforms would be chosen as the relative um, uh, a higher impact in terms of productivity. And then in terms of marketing and branding, right, which both of them are parts of, uh, branding is part of marketing, we see again that social network sites are perceived as more useful than other tools. Okay. So it's very interesting when you look a little bit deeper into the data because initially we could have dismissed social networking sites and we could have said, you know what, there's no point using them. They're very dangerous. People goof off on them anyway. There's a lot of uh, malware and phishing on Facebook. So uh, we probably should get rid of it in our organization. On the other hand, we see that social network sites, such as Facebook, are considered quite useful for a variety of purpose. And if we have the her a third hand, we would actually find out that about half of the organizations in the survey actually block Facebook altogether in the workplace. All right? So um, I don't know if you're able to follow and to manage all these contradictions, which I am purposefully throwing at you, right? Uh, but we see that this is complex. It's not that easy. It's quite complicated. Granted, this is global data. It will vary by country. It will vary by sector. It will vary for a particular organization, we might find that some particular organizations embrace Facebook and others ban it altogether, right? But at the global level, we see this, uh, these kind of sets of contradictions or paradoxes. And I think we have a question. If you remember to press your button. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you. So I'm confused. Uh, I understand why a company would want to block Facebook within their own corporation, and yet they could still have a Facebook page to promote and market their product outside of their own company. Why is that a contradiction? Right. Well, yeah, so actually um, it is an apparent contradiction, but you provided a very good explanation for what might be going on in the data. That is very true. Uh, what some companies choose to do, they choose to block si social media sites like Facebook for all employees except those who work in marketing and public relations. Right? And so those create Facebook pages and manage their Facebook pages and customer, engage in customer relationship management and uh, you know, customer service even in social media. But at another level, 
There's yet another paradox that was pointed out by one of the social media consultants uh, I interviewed. And he said, listen, let's assume that all organizations do the same thing. On the one hand, they use Facebook for marketing. On the other hand, they ban most of their employees from using Facebook. All right? So this might mean that we're going to uh, have a lot of marketing uh, pages that don't have an audience because nobody's allowed to use Facebook or maybe marketers are going to market to each other. Granted, this is a bit of an overgeneralization, but I thought it was quite an interesting and funny point that he made. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. I don't know. I just had a comment about it. Um, mm -hmm. It could be because that they're blocking the Facebook, uh, Facebook thingy because uh, it's a security threat. Also, the productivity of the workers will go down if they keep on Facebooking or MySpacing in office. Mm -hmm. So this could be the reason that they are blocking it. But obviously, their audience for marketing is not the office employees of uh, the employees of their own office, but it's the outside world. So right. Right, but the outside world is made primarily of other employees at other companies. It's not so always just the employees, because I don't think it's just the employees that go on Facebook. Mm -hmm. They can go on Facebook when they are outside the office hours. Okay. So it does mean that they see the advertisements. It just means that they don't see it in the office. During, during, of course, and that's why I said, you know, this was a bit of an overgeneralization. And, uh, it, you know, there is some good point and there's some truth to that. Um, I found it quite amusing also, and so that's why I couldn't help myself. But yes, you're, you're very right that it is an overgeneralization. Good. Um, and so actually, uh, to your point about um, vu vulnerability and security threat, uh, indeed social network sites did emerge as the highest perceived security threat uh, for um, organizations, of a bit more than half of organizations worldwide. And uh, yes, probably that is why, um, along with the reasons that you mentioned about productivity, uh, also about half of the organization surveyed block Facebook. Although we should be aware that Facebook is not necessarily the major and most uh, popular social network site um, worldwide, right? There are some countries where Facebook dominates and other countries where other social network sites dominate. But it seems that perceptions of social network sites are uh, quite consistent. Um, and then, quite interestingly, webmail, although you're not going to be surprised that webmail um, and email in general is perceived as a security threat, uh, followed by content sharing, streaming media, and collaborative platforms, which were perceived as the safest. And again, this is no surprise because the collaborative platforms are usually installed behind the firewall, right? So they can be, um, they're a lot safer. Okay. So in terms of employee use of Web 2.0, right? Um, what were organizations concerned about? What could happen if, um, in terms of security if employees use Web 2.0? Um, as you can see here, these were the main um, and about all the security threats that they, um, they perceived. And um, I would like, since I'm a communication PhD, but you're probably uh, much more interested in this kind of information than I am, why don't you tell me about it? Does it make sense to you? Is it surprising? Is there something that you would have ex expected a number to be lower or higher? Yes, please, remember, yeah. Uh, so I was expecting information overexposure to be the uh, top uh, reason here because um, you can to a certain extent trust uh, big web 2.0 companies to test their uh, software really well uh, and viruses and malware I mean they can prevent it you can rely on them to do that but mm -hmm. uh, information overexposure is not in anybody's hands so even if a company adopts uh, uh, say uh, allows Gmail its employees to use Gmail um, you would not expect, uh, say, because it has a spam filter and a, and a virus filter, you probably would not expect uh, viruses and malware to be a big problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I was expecting information or exposure to be evaluated higher. Okay. Does anybody else think the same? Yeah, you do? I'll second that. Okay. Yeah, you second. Um, and was, were there any other thoughts or comments about uh, these percentages that came out from the survey?
Well, we showed uh, these percentages to a cybercrime strategist from within McAfee. Um, her name is Pamela Warren. And uh, when she saw this information, just like you, she was concerned that the percentage for inf information overexposure seemed to be quite low. But more than that, she was concerned, and other security experts that I talked to, there were concerns about data leaks being so low, at only 7%. All right? Um, and they provided the following possible explanations for this percentage. One, if such an attack that results in data leaks is successful, people might not know about it. So the number might actually be higher, but people are not aware that, they ha that this happened. Or, you know, given that this was a phone survey, it might be embarrassing to admit that it happened. And so some people in some countries, um, depending on their own values, their organizational culture, maybe even national culture, might have underreported this kind of information. However, these security concerns overall, whatever they might be, are quite valid since security incidents did happen to about 70% of uh, the organizations they surveyed. In the past 12 months, 70% had had some sort of security incident. Now again, when you have to think about this, when you ask somebody, did you have any security incidents within the past 12 months, right? Different people might define security incident differently, right? So it would have to be quite a noticeable event for, the, for them to have reported it. If you add maybe some of the smaller incidents, it is possible that this percentage might be a bit higher. And these uh, security incidents cost organizations, on, uh, on average, $2 million per organization, right, for a year. So that is quite a lot of money. If you look at the amount of money that was um, lost worldwide across all the organizations, it is scary and mind-boggling. It would actually um, have been able to solve a lot of the world's problems if this money was used, for example, for you know, charity causes. Uh, it is a very, very high cost. The cost varies by country. It seems to be a bit higher um, in the countries that report high Web 2.0 adoption, which makes sense. And uh, it tends to be very high in Japan as well. But then uh, my guess is that everything is expensive in Japan. It is. <laughs> OK. So let's see what these uh, people feared most. In terms of potential negative consequences of employee use of Web 2.0, what would go could go wrong? And of the things that could go wrong, which ones were more important to them? Which were the negative consequences that they perceived to matter most? Uh, very interesting that the top two are not IT related. Okay, It's uh, damage done to the company's reputation. And I don't know if you remember, uh, it was not very long ago, where a Domino employee posted a video on YouTube that involved uh, mm, spitting while preparing pizza? I shouldn't have told you that. Maybe I hope you didn't order Domino's last night. <laughs> okay, you can see how something like this might damage the company's reputation. Uh, there are um, all sorts of histories, you know, if you search the news, there's a lot of information about maybe flight attendants complaining about customers on Facebook. Um, well, they do lose their jobs. Even a teacher who was complaining about students on Facebook, and she lost her job, right? Um, so you can see how the organization's reputation may be easily damaged by a comment an employee makes on their own time. Okay, so that is a very interesting societal issues issue, something that um, I think about a lot, but I guess it's not really within the scope of this report or this research. And again, loss of client confidence, which is very closely related, if you think about it, to reputation damage. Okay, uh, in the Domino's example, uh, we may say that they did lose quite a lot of client confidence, right? Um, but then uh, almost half of them were concerned about system downtime, so finally we see an IT issue there. And then uh, regulatory fines that they might encounter um, from regulatory agencies, maybe for uh, disclosing information or disclosing inappropriate information. 
or offending someone. Okay, so then what do companies do to manage these risks? Okay, there, I don't know if you follow uh, this controversy in the media and in certain trade publications and certainly uh, in the blogosphere, there's a lot of debate about whether companies should block access to social media or not, whether they should restrict it or not. And so on the one hand, we have uh, industry analysts and consultants who are very enthusiastic about social media. They do not believe that it should be blocked or restricted. They believe that that approach is pretty much, you know, like the legendary ostrich that hits its head in the sand uh, uh, to assume that he's, it's protected from problems. But on the other hand, you have the people who work in IT security who say, listen, if this is not needed for a person's job, they shouldn't have access to it. There are people in IT, certain IT security experts who say, hey, if internet access is not needed for you to do your job, you shouldn't even have internet access. You should just be on a computer on your own and then if you wanted to check your email, um, you go down 20 floors and there's going to be a computer in the lobby and maybe a line of three or four people and then you could go check your email, make sure that your kid or your cat or whatever is okay. Right? And so the IT security experts, they're right. From an IT security perspective, they are right. From a job satisfaction perspective, or maybe even a productivity pr perspective, they may be wrong. But then it's not their job to think about productivity, right? Okay, so this is very interesting. Um, I'm assuming that mo most of you um, might be tempted to take the side of the IT security expert and I apologize if my assumption is wrong, but on the other hand, you have to imagine yourself as that employee. And how would it make you feel if your employer didn't trust you to use Facebook at work or check Twitter for 30 seconds now and again? There are actually other surveys of the millennial generation, people in the United States who were born after 1980. The surveys show that if this was the case, they would either not work for that company at all or violate the rules anyway, because they're smart, they can figure out a way, and they probably have an iPhone in their pocket anyway. Okay? So we need to... <laughs> or a droid, or whatever's cool right now, I don't know. Okay? Um, so you need to think about this, this is a larger issue, again, that influences IT security, but also management, right? And um, HR, human resource management as well, and it's really not that simple. But let's see what our companies in the survey, what they report doing. Um, we broke this down, or rather Lorraine broke this down by organization size. And we have small organizations that have no social media policy whatsoever. Okay? And by the way, even the web tool advocates, the ones who think that everybody should have access to social media all the time and that employees should be trusted, they say, they argue, they vehemently believe, to quote one of the experts that I interviewed, that companies should have a social media policy and that they should be training their employees to make smart decisions on social media because it's a new communication environment, a new social context even, and some people might not make the right decision at all times. But here we see that uh, many of the small organizations do not have social media policies, but the um, larger ones, about 15%, large and medium, do have them. Um, the blue bars indicate that they monitor use of social media. That's about 20% uh, the minimum, 29% the maximum for large organizations. And now if you think in terms of data leak protection, that might actually make sense. If you think in terms of individual privacy, Oh, wait, Zuckerberg said there is no individual privacy. Never mind, moving on. Or that we don't want it. Okay. Um, the pink bar shows that the percentage of companies that control or restrict access to social media, and that varies. It, uh, you could see the, larger, the com larger companies tend to control more than the smaller ones. And blocking access altogether uh, at large organizations, 20% block access altogether, the smaller organizations are less likely to block access to social media altogether. Um, and this is actually pretty good news, believe it or not. Uh, there are other surveys that are done um, in the United States 
uh, that show that blocking access actually is a much higher percentage, but in the United States, this is worldwide data. Okay. So here's another piece of, you, of news from the survey. More than half of organizations worldwide do not allow employees to bring in their own software or hardware. Okay. So how many of you have smartphones and how many of you use them to access the PAL network at Purdue, the wireless network? Okay. Yeah, I do too. And um, I feel pretty good about it. I feel pretty grateful to Purdue that I can access right, the wireless um, on my iPhone. Um, I can reply to emails faster. Most of them are work emails. I paid for the iPhone myself. I'm paying for the subscription plan. I'm using it mostly for work, right, when I'm on campus. But 53% of organizations would say, do not allow your employees to use your iPhone, their iPhones on the company network. Or if possible, I don't know, maybe check them out at the door, right? Um, I have the freedom to install whatever I need on my laptop. And um, Lorraine and I used Skype a lot. Um, when we um, worked on this project. It is actually funny because as we worked on this project uh, for how many months is it now? Two, three months? This is the second time we're meeting in person. Okay. <laughs> not, not because we don't like each other, but uh, <laughs> it's more comfortable to wear your pajamas and do the work, right? Okay. And uh, so we like Skype a lot. We find it very useful and we wanted to include the McAfee people in Skype conversations. Well, they weren't allowed to download it and install it on their personal laptop, on their work laptops, which I found uh, quite <laughs> interesting. Um, of, um, anyway, um, so this is actually an issue, um, a very big issue that's being discussed right now um, in society, in business, in IT trend publications. You are going to encounter this issue as the consumerization of IT. Have you heard this term before, anybody? Yeah, so it's quite interesting. The consumerization of IT is a phenomenon that's happening only recently, okay? And what this means is that in the recent years, the technology that we have access at home, right, our computers at home, our personal phones, um, is actually much better than the technology we have access to at work, all right? Uh, my department put a computer, a desktop, on my uh, desk when I started my job here at Purdue, and I said, no, thank you, I'll use mine. <laughs> All right? They, they were pretty happy for it, actually. I don't know if you have uh, some of these fancy PlayStations and Microsoft gaming consoles. Some of them are actual mini supercomputers, right? They're extremely powerful. So you're used to that. You're used to that kind of speed, that kind of uh, level of interactivity and animation. And then you go to work, and I don't want to name any products, but, and you use, well, yes, I do. And then you come to work and use Blackboard. That felt so good. <laughs> All right? Um, there is a lot of frustration there, and you can see how employees in this generation one, expect the same kind of level of technology and of features and speed and internet connection at work like they have at home. And if the technology at work lets them down, they want to be able to use their own technology because it's so much better, so much faster, so much easier to do your job if you could only use your own thing, right? Um, however, because of security issues, many companies are not allowing employees to do that, right? And then you have a problem and you have a big debate related to the consumerization of IT, of whether companies should allow employees to bring personal software and hardware into the office, uh, since it seems that consumer uh, products are really, the market of consumer products is advancing at a much faster level and you know we change our phones and we change our personal computers sometimes much faster than the company can afford to change theirs. Right? And so this is a very important and a very interesting issue. And if you're thinking again about that survey that I told you about, about millennials, uh, you might find out that the future is in allowing employees to bring their own technologies to work. They will be happier, they will be more productive, but it will pose higher security risks, which companies need to figure out how to mitigate. 
Speaking of risk mitigation, we're ready to look at the third section of our results. And this was something that was very, very worrisome for me. And remember, I come from the public relations communication side. And we looked at organizations that do not have social media policies in place at all. They do not have any policy for how employees, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, any guidelines teaching the employees how to use social media. Actually, one in three organizations do not have a social media policy. This is very sad news, if you ask me. Um, those who do have social media policies, this is what's in them. Employee liabilities. Sites that are approved by company for use. Guidelines about security issues related to social media. Guidelines about commercial dangers. Company liabilities if you mess up on social media. And guidelines on how to represent your company well. So my extremely artistic interpretation was meant to feature the fact that most of the terms of these social media policies are negative. They're things that you cannot or should not do. This is something that's bothering a lot of social media consultants. The ones that we interviewed said that overall the social media policies they see are bad. They're lists of thou shalt not do this and that but they don't actually teach anything to the employees in terms of what they can do and how they should do it, right? And so it's very interesting that we see these kinds of terms in their social media policies and that even those who do have social media policies, many people would say that they still need to do some work here, right? Um, in terms of maybe rewriting or rethinking their social media policy. And actually, many of the experts we interviewed, both on the social media consultancy and the security side, they agreed that writing a social media policy and putting it somewhere on the intranet is not enough. It is not sufficient. What you actually need to do is you need to do training with employees. You need to show them scenarios. What would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? Look what happened to this teacher who got fired because of something she said on Facebook. So they said that writing a policy is really not sufficient. As long as social media are still very new, it, it, we need more education and more training. All right. And so, um, also in terms of mitigating risks, you see here what organizations are doing after uh, they've started using Web 2.0, what kind of security measures uh, they have started to take. And again, maybe this is my time to ask you what you think about these. Do they make sense? Do you agree? Would you do anything differently? I see people nodding. I see people thinking. I don't see anybody sleeping. That is good. <laughs> All right. So um, if, if you were, you know, in charge of ID security, would you do that or would you do things differently? Not sure, or we have an opinion. If we have an opinion, you have to remember to use your microphone. All right, uh, this is just what I think. Maybe they should focus more on authentication. Okay, and we see a couple of other people agreeing with that. Okay, can somebody explain why? Okay, um, if, first of all, humans don't tend to have different passwords for everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure if we ask around this class, um, most of us will have one password for a lot of things because we do not remember passwords at all. And we have a lot of accounts, bank accounts, um, say office logins and stuff like that. So we'll be using some, just one password for that. If by chance I happen to sneak peek um, and see what your password and user ID is, and get that, I will be able to log into your system or the office system. And obviously, once there's an intruder in the system, then it's a piece of cake for the person to yeah. have uh, do damage to the organization. Thank you. And so, here is your summary of our main findings. 
Okay, this is what you heard about today, all this big survey. We divided it into three main topics and you heard some highlights, global trends in these three main topics. And I want to thank you so much for your interest and attention in this topic. And I want to make sure that you have our contact information um, and our email addresses in case you have any questions. And then again, if you want to read the entire report, it is available online. Thank you so much.